let me let me first, Mr. President, uh, tell a few things about your uh, extremely interesting uh, career. Uh, you were a student in Moscow. Uh, in Ukraine. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, in Ukraine, in the yeah. Soviet Union then. Uh, in the Soviet time, at the time of Gorbachev. Yes. And uh, so that was, of course, a, an extremely interesting uh, time to be a, a student uh, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. And your field was military journalism. And uh, you uh, could uh, observe uh, the, the, the last year of the uh, communist regime uh, from, from within, and, and in a very interesting way. I mean, we don't have time to discuss it in, in depth. That's one point. And after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, you became soon an, uh, uh, a political uh, actor, so with a background in journalism. And altogether, uh, uh, you have been in office for 12 years, uh, four years, I think, as a prime minister and uh, eight years uh, as a president, two terms uh, president. Uh, and uh, I understand that your political uh, career is not necessarily uh, finished. Uh, and during those years, uh, you have developed a very interesting foreign policy that we will discuss in a minute. But uh, let me start, uh, perhaps, uh, to, by asking you uh, to say a few words about the economic uh, situation in Mongolia, because uh, not so long ago, Mongolia was uh, considered to be a, a real emerging, a booming country. And then, of course, the commodity uh, crisis uh, came, and the situation is slightly uh, different today. So uh, could you please uh, tell us a few words about, about the current situation and foreseeable uh, situation in, in, in uh, the Mongolian economy, and then we will uh, switch to uh, wider subjects. Yeah, I think this is a great platform, this World Policy Conference, and uh, I'm really grateful uh, for you and for your team and putting these things here. And uh, also, I am really grateful for our gracious host, Kingdom of Morocco. Yesterday night was really amazing. And about Mongolia and our economy, you know, Mongolia is uh, more than 3 million people, 1.5 million square kilometer land, 60 million cattle. And Mongolia is uh, one of the 10 richest countries in terms of the mineral resources and many foreigners and investors are, are actually attracted by that. And uh, one time Mongolia was in during 2011, 2012, was fastest growing economy in the world. That uh, rate was 17%. And now we have 3%. And the uh, Mongolian economy is based on the commodity. Uh, our biggest market is China. Mongolia is based between Russia and China most liberal and free and most liberal economic and political establishment. But uh, still there are uh, some uh, big interest in Mongolia uh, investing. If people think that I think uh, Mongolia is a good place in terms of the market, in terms of the young population and openness, Mongolia is a really open country. And uh, everyone coming to invest, I think, they can benefit from Mongolian uh, cooperation. Well, thank you uh, very much. So uh, now let, let's switch to uh, in international affairs and the, the contribution of, uh, of Mongolia, which uh, actually is much more than uh, uh, most people think uh, because uh, of your, uh, uh, you have a very close uh, relations with uh, both Koreas. You know, uh, well, South Korea, but also North Korea. You know the situation extremely well. Uh, there are some cultural also connections between Mongolia and, and Korea. Uh, you have also a, a very balanced uh, relations uh, with uh, Russia and uh, China. and. Uh, you have a, had a personal role, you still have a personal role, maybe that you will comment on. You also have uh, 
uh, deep knowledge and relation with Iran. Uh, and this is not uh, the end of the list. So this is relatively unknown, uh, except uh, for uh, 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 a few experts. So uh, it would be very interesting to, li to listen to you, uh, to listen to you, to you talking about these uh, uh, aspects of the Mongolian foreign policy, to which you have been a great uh, contributor. In terms of the, our relations with North Korea, and we have an embassy in North Korea in Pyongyang. We have a long-standing relationship with uh, South Korea. And uh, also, my government and myself initiated the uh, launch of one initiative called Ulaanbaatar Dialogue on Northeast Asia security. It's like Helsinki process. It's still going on every, Ju every June, every year. We have experts from North Korea and South Korea, from America, from Europe, and Russia, China, Japan. And we are bringing them and also discussing issues related with the North uh, East Asian situation. I several times visited North Korea, and I gave a lecture at the Kim Il-sung University titled, No Dictatorship Lasts Forever. And uh, they actually asked me not to mention the word related democracy, human rights, marked economy. But I didn't mention that. I gave that lecture. That was a really interesting experience for me. And uh, many North Koreans come to Mongolia, and uh, we, we, we are still keeping that channel open. Now there is one of the biggest questions, how to stop, how to deal with this North Korean nuke issues. And I have my own perspectives there. I think. Uh, uh, there needs to be kind of dual channel. Uh, you know, Korean War never ended with the peace agreement. North Koreans want to have that peace agreement. I think peace agreement, nuke issues should be discussed in a, in, at the same time. That might be good. I think uh, Korean nuke, uh, nuclear program is not an ordinary one. That the uh, regime depended on that. Without nu nuclear program, I think that regime can, might be not survive. Because of that, we understand we have to give some type of the face saving tool and face saving opportunities to them. And that's the, that might be uh, that uh, peace agreement. Also, there are Chinese talking about the dual freeze, freezing the thought system in South Korea and beginning to talk also freezing the nuclear program. And I think in this regard, we need to have some trusted partner. And my country and myself and my country is, can be, Mongolia can be that trusted partner because we have no vested interest and we have really good relations with Japan, with China and Russia, with both Korea and with America. And Mongolia hosted several meetings, bilateral meetings between North Korea and Japan in Ulaanbaatar during my time. I think we can play really some, some special role there. And uh, I, I'm, I'm ready to contribute to that. And that, that's my take on North Korean issue. Yeah. So maybe we can. Uh, you mentioned the Russia and China also. Yes, we will move to that uh, just after. But, just after, but let, let us stay uh, what, two or three minutes more on, 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 Cor on Korea. You mentioned, uh, I think now everyone understands that that for North Korea, uh, uh, accessing to nuclear weapons is a matter of survival, of regime survival. So uh, could, you be, could you be more specific on what kind of compromise uh, could be acceptable for uh, the North Korean regime uh, that would be, in fact, giving up <laughs> uh, nuclear weapons and nevertheless feel, feeling uh, seriously uh, reassured uh, on, on, on the future of the regime itself. You know? uh, so it's, it's a very difficult uh, equation. I think crucial thing is engagement. If I were the leader of the US or other country, China, I would invite Kim Jong-un there. And we need to take him out from his vacuum and to show how is world, you know, looking for them and what, what kind of possibilities there. And the engagement is a crucial thing. And there is 
now almost no engagement. And because of that, I think also they want to, to, to talk issues and the people, uh, most of the powers didn't listen to that. They, they only say that you stop your nu nuclear program. If you don't stop that, if you don't accept this condition, we will not talk. I think there needs to be open second door, peace agreement, and other issues. There, there are other many dimensions. And I think dialogue is uh, very important. And as we talked, there in, in a dialogue, there is no losers, no winners. Because of that, uh, engagement is really crucial. Have you ever met uh, Kim Jong-un yourself? Officially not. Uh, non officially, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you seem to be mentally totally healthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I met many, yeah, yeah. many leaders. And his father, many, the father? His father, actually, uh, his grandfather visited Mongolia yeah. two times. Um, yeah, we have yeah. that relations and historical relations, yeah. yeah. Mongolians raised many North Korean orphanage children in Mongolia and after the war. And we, we, I think uh, Mongolia maintaining since the inception of the North Korean state our diplomatic relations, so one of few countries. So let us switch now to Russia, China. Russia and China are our two big neighbors, and uh, we have one important uh, mechanism now. Uh, we call it uh, summit. Mongolian president, Russian president, and Chinese president, we have uh, once every year, every year once we meet at a high level, and we had uh, three meetings, and uh, now we are maintaining, and our new president will maintain it, and China and Russia is committed to that. And also Russia, China is really respecting our people's choice and our way of life, our uh, sovereign right existing between them, and we don't have any political or border disputes with Russia and China. And we existed. We are living together for centuries, maybe for thousands of years. And you know, Mongolians actually built the biggest land empire one time under Genghis Khan, Hublai Khan. From the historical terms, Mongolians actually introduced new world order. During that, the Mongolians ruled under written law. That, uh, that law called great, uh, great government. And uh, also, Mongolians respected their religious belief. Mongolians had a mo uh, established most biggest uh, pony type express postal system all over our kingdom. And uh, we, we, we were in Persia, we were in Asia, we were in uh, Europe. And because of that, I think Mongolian thinking is quite big. And uh, because of that, we, we are really proud of our history. We are really proud of our present. And Mongolia is only liberal political economic establishment since 1990 in our region. We have uh, one of the advanced election system in, in Mongolia, for example. Every election is computerized and the fingerprint system and biometric system. In uh, election results can be seen on a TV screen, uh, every, every household. And we have that vibrant democracy. And now myself is committed to sharing our experiences. We are not going to teach to anyone. And people come from the Myanmar, Eastern countries, even from North Korea. Learn there is different way. If you give to the people rights and people can use that and people can be creative. Free people can be really creative. And the Mongolian philosophy of development is very different than Russia and China. And my philosophy also, we have to give more right to our people. There shouldn't be no central nervous system like a starfish. If you cut fingers on one finger of the starfish, that grow because there is no central nervous system. But uh, if there is bad president or bad government in Mongolia, I think our people should survive, thanks to their right, thanks to their creativeness. And uh, I think uh, interesting place. 
There is no censorship on media, total freedom of expression taught in Mongolia. I think uh, if you've never been in Mongolia, if you are interested to go to Mongolia, it's the place to go to see some great experiences there. And I must uh, add, which is also not uh, well known, that under your leadership, uh, the death uh, punishment has been abolished. Capital punishment. Uh, the capital punishment, yes. Capital punishment is abolished under your, 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 your leadership. Uh, at a different uh, level, you know, when I was uh, a young, uh, young uh, director of the policy planning staff in the French Foreign Ministry, uh, we used to say that the worst uh, capital to be an ambassador was Ulan Bator. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a name, maybe somebody whose name you know, uh, who uh, say he was Monsieur Perruche. Monsieur Perruche was very famous because uh, he had been ambassador to Ulan Bator, living in a very small uh, apartment, which was the embassy at the same time. Uh, and um, he found that uh, to be uh, um, ambassador to, to Vietnam at the, at the time, which he also was, was paradise compared to Ulan Bator. So uh, I understand that, that after was, the collapse... That was different time, different of, system. Ex exactly. And now so, we even some French ambassadors, <laughs> after their retirement, leaving permanently in Ulan Bator. Yeah, that, that was actually to be my point. The, the extraordinary <laughs> change uh, is one illustration among many of all the changes that occurred after the collapse uh, of the Our Soviet Union. Our friend Mr. Fabius is a very famous advocate for Mongolia, Mongolian freedom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but uh, and, and not only Mr. Fabius. I think that today Mongolia Mang Mang is uh, being discovered also, by, maybe for some in the room also that's the case. So uh, uh, tell us a few words about Iran. Iran, I had a chance to visit Iran, and that was really interesting. During that time, I became the only sitting president who visited the underground nuclear facility in Iran. And uh, during my visit, I met the Ayatollah Khamenei. And when Ayatollah Khamenei, we, we shake our hands, and he told that, you know, Iranian people and myself is very grateful for Mongolia. And obvious question, why? And he said, the, the, you know, during Mongolian domination in Persia, Mongolians built first hospitals there, first universities there, first observatory there, even first hospital for mentally ill people, treating them by music. And also Mongolians made Shia religion, main dominant religion during that time. And Ayatollah Khamenei is regarded the head of the Shia religion. And I visited uh, yeah, many good places, and people have that warm memory. And because of that, we have that relations. And after my visit, that was constant. Const constant, uh, uh, I actually started that uh, Iran nuclear deal things, uh, agreement things. And uh, I think one thing I would like to say that Iran nuclear agreement is a really important one. To this uh, American administration and Mr. Trump, President Trump, is making that a little bit questionable. If he makes that step, if he makes that step, I think that's going to cost very highly. That's the credibility issue. You know, if, if America go out, America aboard that deal, I think one country is going to be uh, nuclear, one power. That's something we have to really worry about. Yeah. But beyond that... And cultural relations between Iran and Mongolia is really important. And there are museums and libraries. When I visit there, some of the museums, there are 60% of their artifacts related with the Ilhan time. Our kingdom during that time called Ilhan. And those kind of relations is really, yeah, interesting for, for us, yeah. Listening to you, by the way, uh, I have uh, omitted something uh, that uh, I, I mentioned your studies in uh, the former Soviet Union, but you also uh, were a student at the Kennedy School of Government. 
No, so uh, that's a good balance. <laughs> and that ex explains uh, to a large extent your uh, knowledge of, uh, of English. So this being said in passing. No, on Iran I have uh, one more uh, question. Do you have uh, cultural, uh, historically uh, links between Iran and, and Mongolia? Yes, we have uh, cultural, historical links. And we have under presidents, we have our, uh, some projects and studying uh, our cultural and historical heritages in Mongolia and in Iran. Thank you. You know, uh, I'm going to, we're going to, uh, to, to, to take the, uh, a few questions in the, remaining, in the remaining minutes, but I would also like to remind you for the, our oldest uh, uh, friends uh, who have attended the World Policy Conference since the first day, that uh, Mongolia has expressed uh, an interest for the World Policy Conference ever since the beginning. And um, uh, former President Ingbayar has attended the first two uh, of those. Then, unfortunately, he was caught into uh, troubles uh, at, at home. Um, uh, and you were uh, his uh, prime, minister prime Minister also yeah. for, 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 for a while. So uh, I think it's uh, interesting uh, noticing because uh, it, it, it shows, and I have myself discovered actually the interest of Mongolia for the, the, the big perspective uh, at, at this time. That's why we are so happy to, to, to have you uh, here. World Policy yeah. Conference, I think this is kind of the symphony of voices. You know, even some people say that why Mongolia, why Mongolian former president is sitting here. Beauty of this scattering, you know, even you can uh, come from Mongolia and you can have some kind of uh, relations or some kind of irrelevance to this and bringing our perspective here. This is a really great uh, opportunity and great place, great platform and we have to maintain it. And I think Mongolia and myself is really committed to this great uh, endeavor and purpose. Yeah. Thank you very much.